I'm going to give a lecture today uh, about the essentials of understanding thoracolumbar injuries and trauma and kind of the classification. And it's a little bit of a historical talk, but it's uh, kind of to bring you up to speed as to where are we here and now today. And I got to acknowledge some of my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Eli Barron, who is uh, our trauma director at the Cedar Spine Center, Terry Kim, uh, another close colleague, and, and Alex Vaccaro, who uh, he doesn't know it, but some of his slides are in my talk because they came from Eli Barron and Eli got slides from Alex. And anyway, Alex is a big part about uh, this whole process of really um, setting in motion the modern day treatment of thoracolumbar trauma. And uh, I, I have to acknowledge him, not just because some of his slides got carried through into this talk that I'm using, but also just because he is such an incredible innovator and he's done so much to uh, really advance the, the whole knowledge base over the past uh, 15 years about thoracolumbar trauma. Uh, these are my disclosures, nothing that conflicts with giving the talk today. Um, what are the consequences of thoracolumbar fracture? Well, it's a bad problem that we have to deal with as uh, neurosurgeons, orthopedic spine surgeons, and uh, we have to assess important things like stability and protect neural elements. And it's not a simple concept. I mean, we're dealing with um, uh, acute changes in the spinal column, which create deformity and neurologic deficit um, and may or may not have uh, incapacitating pain problems. Um, who gets thoracolumbar fractures? Males 15 to 30 is the most common. Elderly women have um, uh, osteoporotic fractures, a whole different kind of uh, injuries, and those are low energy injuries. Um, what's the incidence uh, of these things? Motor vehicle accidents are the most common, obviously, falls as well. Sports is actually a pretty infrequent one. Uh, and uh, violence, uh, um, actually a pretty high number, which is interesting. Other fills in the blanks. Um, where, where do these occur? Well, they occur in the uh, thoracic spine uh, um, between T1 and T10 uh, pretty infrequently. Uh, most of them are at the thoracolumbar junction and then the uh, lumbar, lower lumbar segments uh, follow next in frequency. Um, why do we have classifications? Well, we need to have a method of description. We have to be able to treat them, facilitate outcome, and they should be comprehensive, reproducible, usable, and accurate. Um, and, and that's really, that, that's been the whole process of developing these things. Historically, uh, Bowler in 1929 described five different kinds of fractures with complex compression, flexion distraction, extension, shear injuries, torsional injuries, and, and uh, a number of uh, uh, historical vignettes is that uh, Watson Jones uh, defined some similar fractures uh, back in the 30s with wedge fractures, comminuted burst fractures, fracture dislocations. And so this kind of advanced things further. Um, other types of injuries of morphologic classifications of stable versus unstable by Nichols in 1942 looked at coal miners with various different types of injuries that are either stable or, in, or unstable related to posterior ligamentous uh, uh, abnormalities, whether they're disrupted or not. And, and actually this was very forward thinking because uh, it pertains to what we really uh, base a lot of our decision making on today in, uh, in the modern era. Um, what are the classifications? Um, we're going to talk about some of these things with some of them that are historical. Um, uh, Denis, uh, McAfee, and Ferguson, Allen, and some of the other contributed to these things over the years. And, and uh, the anatomic classifications really looked at a two-column theory back in the 60s and said, well, there's a front half of the spine and a back half of the spine. And it seems to make sense. And it, it, uh, it actually was a good stepping stone, and we learned how to utilize these things. And uh, it stressed the posterior uh, elements uh, that if they're destabilized, we ought to consider surgery. And uh, first uh, to introduce, introduce the uh, mechanism kind of description, but it really didn't uh, address all of the issues. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, Denis described the three column uh, theory of which there were uh, five types and 20 subtypes that looked at uh, the ALL, the middle column and the posterior column. And uh, it really did make a lot of sense. And it was another good stepping stone as to where we are right now. These anatomic classifications, important, uh, importance was placed on the middle column. And that was stressed as being 
uh, the most important part. And if it's unstable in two or more columns, there was an instability problem. And um, so the issues is that it kind of left us with an over oversimplification and uh, it really didn't address the operative stabilization when it's necessary. And then not operative treatment was not really clearly defined as well. So it left, uh, it left some things unanswered. Um, with the advent of the MRI scanner, it certainly helped what we do today. Um, Punjabi took that a little bit further in the 90s. He studied in a laboratory with experimental produced trauma, looked at the neutral zone, the range motion, and found the middle column uh, probably did dictate uh, stability issues. So that was another big advance as well. And uh, McCormick, and it, it's actually Gaines and McCormick, looked at some of these things in the 90s as well. And uh, the, they wanted to find out why they failed. Could they be pre prevented? Uh, and they, they were really kind of focused on when should we do anterior surgical reconstruction. And uh, this, this is one of those uh, papers that made a lot of sense to me when I was studying these things back in this era is that uh, it looked at comminution, it looked at fragment displacement, it looked at kyphosis, and it basically uh, quantitated those with one, two, and three scores. And so you have three different uh, types of morphology assessment, and you get uh, three different severities. And so it was basically a, a classification scale that uh, went from one to nine um, none of them are zero, obviously, so it anywhere from went three to nine, but it was actually a very good, another stepping stone for us to learning how we're uh, now treating these things. What about the mechanistic classifications? You know, just different ways to look at these things and to uh, whether these pre predispose to different injuries. And some of these are kind of historical as well, and um, they would look at the different types of fractures and it's just a mechanism of what it is. Paul McAfee kind of went into this as well a little bit in some of his studies in the 1980s. Um, and the mechanistic classification looked at compression fractures and they said it was a pure axial compression. And the uh, middle of the end plate fails first, it's the highest stress, the anterior body fails and creates a wedging. So these actually make sense also and you just have to, have to kind of put these into your thought process as you learn and as uh, residents and fellows, these are important things to kind of keep all of them in mind because they make sense as to how and why we treat things and why we've come up with some of the more modern technology that we have. Uh, flexion compression fractures uh, looks at anterior compression, posterior tension and uh, disruption of posterior structures, uh, the vertebral body collapses and the posterior elements tear. So, these are pretty severe injuries, obviously, and they would fit into some of the different classifications I'll talk about in a bit. What's a stable burst fracture? Well, these are beautiful illustrations that show some of the uh, fractures of the vertebral body and uh, some of the fracturing of the posterior and ligamentous stretching, but uh, this is considered a stable fracture that we would probably put into a brace and we would treat these things uh, not operatively and they go on to do very well, pretty reliably. What about unstable burst fractures? Now, these are ones with canal compromise, neurologic injury, and they have a severe posterior ligamentous injury and they need surgical treatment. Going back to the mechanistic classification, you look at these things like chance fractures and things like that. And looking at some of these injuries is that uh, uh, they're fractures through the vertebral body, through the posterior elements, um, and they can be highly unstable and they can be treated with fairly simple treatment um, uh, paradigms and, and methods that we have. What about flexion distraction and injuries with fulcrum within the middle column and where they have these type of fractures where it's basically a ligamentous injury through and through. It can be through the disc space and they're potentially highly unstable fractures. What about fracture dislocation? Well, the name itself uh, implies what, the, what and where the problem is, is that uh, it's a globally unstable injury. There's a dislocation uh, through the uh, vertebra, usually through the disc space, through the facet joints, highly unstable that require something that's a, oftentimes a bigger operation that we actually used to do these with smaller procedures like illustrated here. Uh, the AO looked at a number of different classification systems as well, and they actually had some big contributions and different ways to look at these things, which um, I, I think they were useful and uh, that's where we've kind of moved on from this is that uh, 
uh, of the different mechanisms. But, um, excuse me, going back, the neurologic classifications, if you look at those alone independently, and you really don't take them in, into consideration of what the structural and the architectural problems are within fractures, um, neurologic problems by themselves can't be utilized as the uh, way to make a decision as to whether somebody needs surgical stabilization or whether um, they don't, and then what type of uh, repair do they need. Um, what about the interpretation of some of these things? Well, we gotta have a checklist system and they, they have to be clinically validated. That's the whole thing. The Punjabi stability checklist looked at uh, giving a numerical uh, um, um, assessment of what the different problems are, looking at anterior and posterior elements, radiographic uh, abnormalities and dislocation and displacement and cauda equina injury, and uh, dangerous loading that was anticipated uh, with mobilization. So. These things uh, were actually good, except the neurologic injury was not well uh, defined. The extent of the anterior injury wasn't really addressed well, and ligamentous injuries were not weighted because it probably is a, a, the most important thing or some of the posterior ligamentous injuries. So anyway, all these classifications, if you summarize them going back into the 1930s all the way to the 2000s, is that uh, you know they were helpful. They gave us a long way, but uh, we have to give them essentially kind of a thumbs down to be able to determine when, where, how, and why should we th we be treating thoracolumbar injuries. Um, Alex Vaccaro, as I'd said in the beginning of the talk, um, really had been uh, um, the key man in, in really pushing forward through the uh, um, spine fractures and the, uh, the study groups that he'd put together and evaluated these things, looking with the T-list uh, evaluation and looking at the, um, um, all the different factors of which go into uh, assessment of um, thoracolumbar injuries. And to create a, a scale that's simple, it's descriptive of injury, and it uh, basically boils down to three parts. And it has a scoring system, assesses neurology, ligamentous status, and helps determine surgical approaches. So these are the three parts and we'll go through them here. And this, this was one of the early studies that uh, put together what he called a new paradigm in the treatment of thoracolumbar spine trauma. And it included the mechanism of injury, neurology and ligamentous integrity. And you're putting these together and the mechanism, the compression, whether it's translation and rotational or distraction, they each were assigned uh, numerical points and uh, one through four. And those added into the integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex, whether it's intact, whether it's intact or indeterminate, or whether it's injured. It's zero to three and neurologic status uh, as well, going from intact up through either a cord injury or a cauda equina injury. And so these totaling up is that if you have injuries with less than three points, they're pretty clearly non-operative. If you have injuries that are in the four point range, they could be non-operative or operative kind of depending. Those are the, the only real gray zone of this but I think it's real clear that if you have patients with five or more points is that they need surgical stabilization. And these depend on the morphology, assigns points, assess the integrity, assign points, neurologic status, assign the points. And they, these are the numerical uh, determinants of what we do with these things. And you consider the clinical qualifiers and then you provide the appropriate treatment. So these are some of the simpler ones, compression fracture, flexion, compression, uh, or minor burst fracture, it's one or two points and that's a non-operative problem. What about a compression burst fracture with a complete uh, injury is, um, or a complete burst fracture is that you have axial compression, that's two points complete uh, uh, neurologically, uh, posterior ligamentous complex, which is zero and you get a four points and a non-operative case. Um, Burst fractures with a complete neurologic injury, you add uh, neurologic problems to it. And uh, these are pretty clear. They add up to seven points and they need surgical intervention. Um, translational, rotatory with a complete dislocation. Uh, these add up to a lot of points and uh, you get four points for distraction, translational, complete neurologic injury and a uh, posterior ligamentous complex with nine points. And these are highly unstable fracture and they're obviously well beyond the uh, level of four or five where you consider surgical treatment. 
So the summary is that if somebody's in the three point range, they don't need surgery. If they're four points, it's uh, probably the one gray zone and anything exceeding five points is gonna obviously need surgery. So what are some of the modifiers? Um, ankylosing spondylitis, DISH, metabolic bone disease. You know, these are some of the other factors that if you have a patient that comes in and has these kind of other problems uh, or multi-trauma patients and uh, there are some other extenuating for circumstances, it may change what you do with surgical treatment. There are a number of other studies that uh, were done by the, uh, um, the Spine Trauma Study Group looking at uh, uh, inter-rater reliability uh, between uh, different surgeons, and they looked at these. There were a whole number of papers that were, I have to really give them credit for all of these things, um, and looked at uh, all the different classification, the impact of uh, training um, probably had a big factor in how to do it. And one of the studies actually had looked at uh, uh, neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons. Uh, interestingly, in the end, they kind of came out the same. Each one had some strength in different directions. Uh, if you looked at fellows and residents and trainees, in some respects, they were actually even better than the, uh, the attendings. Uh, there were differences in nationalities. Uh, so there were various different studies that came out of all of these uh, great uh, groups of work with all these people had done it. So what are the, the summary for the decision-making? Understanding the status of the posterior ligamentous complex, uh, advanced imaging technology that we have and the confidence in non-operative treatment, whether the patient's neurologically intact and the preservation of the posterior ligamentous complex are really the keys. So I hope this is helpful. Uh, it's been uh, enjoyable um, sharing a lot of these things with you and uh, good luck in your future career. Thank you very much.